The listening section has three parts. Part 1. Four short conversations, each followed by one question. Part 2. One longer conversation, followed by four questions. Part 3. One lecture, followed by six questions. You will hear each conversation or lecture only one time. You must answer each question before continuing. To continue to the next question, click the Next button. In this section, you cannot use the Back button to return to an earlier question. The number of questions and the amount of time you have to answer the questions will be shown separately for each section in the question time left window on your screen. Time is not counted while you are listening to the conversation or lecture. One. There's something wrong with the TV. Only Channel 17 has a good picture. Maybe the cable vision isn't working. Which channel has a good picture? Two. Hello. I'd like to speak with Mr. Davis, please. This is Thomas Ward with the Office of Immigrations. I'm sorry, Mr. Ward. Mr. Davis is in conference now. Who works for the Immigrations Office? Three. Fill it up with regular and check the oil, please. Right away, miss. Where did this conversation most probably take place? Let's go to the movies after dinner. Well, I'll go if you really want to, but I'm a little bit tired. What conclusion does the woman want us to make from her statement? Listen to a conversation between a professor and his student. Hello, Michelle. Can I help you? Hello, Professor. I was wondering if you had a few minutes to uh, talk to me about my essays. Sure. Sit down. Thanks. Professor, you, uh, you gave me a C plus on my last essay. That's the third C you've given me now. I guess I just don't understand what it is you're looking for. Well, you're not alone, Michelle. I'm afraid most of the class is doing poorly this term. Now, I've tried to explain what I want you all to do several times now, but nobody seems to get it. I guess I'm a failure as a teacher. Huh, I don't think so, but I'm sorry. Would you mind trying one more time with me? 
I understand that you want to see a clear, efficient development of a thesis and all that, and I thought I'd done it this time. I really did. Have you got your paper with you? Yes, here it is, right here. Let me have a look. Sure, here. Hmm, yes, I remember now. Actually, Michelle, you have a very good thesis here. I like it. I just wish you could have presented it more effectively. In what, in what way? Well, just look at your opening sentence. This is the first sentence that the reader meets. Most authorities consider the zygote the initiation of a new existence. Now tell me, Michelle, if the average person picked this up and started reading it, would they understand that? Well, um, I hope so. I mean, I presume so. That's what I presumed when I wrote it, of course. Of course. It seems short and direct. But you must remember that when you wrote this, you had been reading and researching your topic beforehand, I hope, but the reader is coming to this cold. How many people know what a zygote is? How self-evident is the meaning of a new existence? That's a very abstract phrase. Yeah, I guess so. Michelle, the writer's first duty is to his readership, and his second duty is to his thesis. Think of all the articles that you've read that have been built on flimsy arguments, misconceptions, or untruths, and yet they have become widely popular, have enjoyed wide acceptance because of the writer's talent at communicating. Yeah, there are a lot of those. You want us to write like that? <laughs> well, I certainly don't want you to be promulgating untruths. That's what I hope I'm helping my students avoid. But it would be worth your while to notice how some of those writers do it. The key to effective writing is know thy readership. Assess your reader accurately. What they know, right? Exactly. What they know and what they don't know. If you talk down to them, they feel insulted. They say to themselves, does he think I'm stupid or something? And they walk away. Well, I don't think that, that's for sure. Maybe not, but your opening sentence borders on the other extreme. If you expect too much of your readers, you'll also put them off. They'll say to themselves, what does he think I am, Einstein? And again, they'll walk away. Well, um, so what should I do, for instance, with this first sentence here? I can't make the grammar any simpler, can I? No, but you can certainly tone down the vocabulary. Either that or define difficult or arcane words when you use them. But that usually slows things down. Anyway, you have to bring yourself and the reader to the same level somehow. That's what you should always be shooting for. So, I should define zygote right off the bat. A zygote, or fertilized egg. That's the idea, but keep it short, or you'll lose the effectiveness of your opening. Why not just go ahead and use egg? Then you can introduce the more, uh, precise scientific term later in the paragraph. Just, an egg is... Sure, it's strong and clear, which is just what you want in order to interest your reader. You have a whole essay to be more precise in, to get down to the details. Then what about the rest? You said that initiation of a new existence is too, um, too... Too abstract. Okay, just tell me this. What do you mean by that phrase? Well, uh, it means, um, the start of a new life, a new living thing. Good. Well, why didn't you say that in the first place? That's much more direct and attention-getting. It's expressed in a way that anyone can understand. An egg is the start, or the beginning, of a new life. But does that sound, well, formal enough, Professor? Don't confuse formality with obfuscation, Michelle. You don't have to write densely to be formal, and Lord knows you don't have to use big words. You just need to avoid slang and, uh, casual language. And be sure that the grammar is standard. Write clearly, simply, directly. That's what makes a good essay. Okay, maybe I've just gotten a better idea of what you're looking for now. Clear, simple, direct. I'll remember that next time. Good, and I'll be looking forward to how well you succeed. I'm not adverse to giving A grades if they're deserved, you know. Thanks for your time, Professor. I really appreciate your help. Not at all, Michelle. That's what I'm here for. See you in class. See you.
listen to part of a university lecture by a professor of natural history. Now, as a part of our study on biological evolution and evolutionary processes, let's look for a few minutes at an extraordinary group of bird species, the birds of paradise. You may have seen pictures of some of these fantastic birds. I think there's one in the next chapter of our textbook. The male birds of paradise are incredibly beautiful creatures. They have extremely elongated and very elaborate sets of many coloured feathers arising from their head and tail and wings, and when the males display for the females during courtship, they can erect and manipulate these feather tracks, waving or shaking or twirling or wiggling these feathers. And at the same time, they often assume very odd postures or do acrobatics, so they put on quite incredible performances to attract females. In fact, the male plumage is so gorgeous that bird of paradise skins have been highly valued trade items for hundreds, if not thousands of years. The birds of paradise are restricted almost entirely to the tropical jungles of the New Guinea archipelago, to the large island of Papua New Guinea and its surrounding islands. Not only have the Papuan men traditionally adorned themselves with bird of paradise feathers since before history, but these feathers appeared as rare and valuable trade goods in other parts of Asia as long as 2000 years ago. However, they weren't discovered by the Western world until the 16th century. In 1520, the famous Portuguese explorer, Ferdinand Magellan, was given several bird of paradise skins by the Sultan of Bachian in the Moluccan Islands and they created quite a sensation back in Europe. As exploration expanded, more and more skins were sent to the United States and Europe, and the beauty of the feathers resulted, of course, in their becoming fashionable decorations for ladies' hats. By the end of the 19th century, thousands of trade skins had been exported from New Guinea. Through London alone, between the years 1904 and 1908, 155,000 skins were imported. Luckily, it was about this time that groups like the Audubon Society and the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds were becoming active defenders of wildlife and from 1908 laws banning the import of bird feathers were beginning to be passed in many countries. In 1955 the government of Nepal was having difficulty getting new bird of paradise plumes for the Royal Nepali Crown for the coronation of their new king Mahendra until they finally arranged for replacements from an illegal shipment of skins that had earlier been confiscated by the US Customs Service. At last, in 1990, Indonesia itself passed a law banning the trade in bird of paradise skins. Incredibly, none of the birds of paradise are endangered species today, although several are on the vulnerable list and on the near threatened list. Today, only sustainable hunting for ceremonial purposes is permitted to the local native tribes. There's about 40 species of birds of paradise, and they're really outstanding examples of the evolutionary phenomenon of species radiation from a single ancestor, because each isolated mountain range in the New Guinea Arpegalo has its own unique endemic species, species that are found nowhere else in the world. The birds of paradise are all very closely related. Actually, they're all closely related to our common crows, but each species has evolved in isolation into something that looks and behaves very different from its relatives on the next mountain or in the next valley. In fact, elevation is probably the single most important ecological sorting mechanism for the adaptive radiation of these birds into so many different, unique forms. On top of their extraordinary plumage, these birds have also developed a whole range of breeding strategies. A few species are monogamous, which means that one male and one female mate and raise young. But most species are polygamous, where the males try to attract and mate with as many females as possible, and the females raise the young birds alone. Some of these polygamous males perform single, non-territorial displays when they find a female. In other cases, the single male frequents some sort of regular display ground, called a court, where he may clear a space and perform for passing females and in yet other species, the males gather at distinctive traditional communal display grounds called lex. Here, many males will compete for female attention and perform as energetically as they can because the females choose the ones who put on the best show. The native Popons call these performances sakalele, or dancing parties, and they are truly amazing exhibitions. Just picture a dazzling gold, white and green greater bird of paradise who leans forward and downward, 
and lowers his open wings to display his large, lacy, golden flank feathers raised above his back and over his head like Japanese fans. Or the immaculate black and turquoise blue bird of paradise, who hangs completely upside down and flexes his legs slowly and rhythmically to vibrate his long, thin tail feathers for the ladies. This big sequential radiation of behaviours and plumages, as well as similar sequential variations in morphology and feeding habits, is a really rich source of research opportunities for graduate students, and I hope that some of you will have the chance to participate in Bird of Paradise research during your careers, because they are amazingly beautiful birds with fascinating habits. <laughs>